Hello, I am Carl Daw, and I have been asked to introduce you to God We Praise You, Favorite Hymns of Jubilati, a new publication from Hope Publishing Company that brings together representative hymns originating with the UK hymn writing and hymn publishing collective known as the Jubilati Group. As you may know, the Jubilati Group began in the 1960s when a number of clergy and musicians produced two collections called Youth Praise, then in the early 70s moved on to Psalm Praise. For the remainder of that decade, they worked towards a new hymnal called Hymns for Today's Church, which first appeared in 1982 and then in a revised edition in 1987. This signature hymnal was especially notable for updating archaic thee and thine pronouns to you and your, and for recasting many texts to make them more comprehensible to 20th century singers. As a means of celebrating the Jubilati's long-standing commitment to making existing hymns more singable, we will look first at two such examples in this new collection. The first of these is an Easter hymn by Christopher Wordsworth, Alleluia, Alleluia, Hearts to Heaven and Voices Raise. You may well know some form of this hymn, since it has long appeared in hymnals, including more than 30 hymnals since 1979. The version of the hymn we are using today reflects a common practice of the Jubilati group of retaining the opening and closing stanzas of the hymn and then inserting two original or rewritten stanzas for the middle of the hymn. Because this text is in the familiar 8787 doubled meter, it appears with a wide range of tunes in the various hymnals. Today, we will have it set to the familiar Welsh tune, Hufferdal, and I encourage you to sing along. <laughs> No! 
The second example of a Jubilati revised familiar hymn is In Christ There Is No East or West. The original John Oxnum text, which appears in many current hymnals, makes a forthright declaration of that admirable opening affirmation, but it doesn't really offer much development of the theme. This expanded version by the late Michael Perry one of the most prolific hymn writers of the Jubilati group, does an effective job of showing both how the life and work of Christ support this perspective and how they compel us to continue the ongoing work of reconciliation. The revised text is still sung to Maki, a tune derived from an African-American spiritual, and that tune helps to underscore the message of this text. One of my favorite comments about the importance of hymns to the life of faith was made by a Moravian bishop who said, if we don't sing about it, we don't believe it. There is much truth in that statement, and it calls attention to the importance of having hymns that recall and reinforce the biblical narrative because hymns serve for many people as their doorway into Scripture. One place in particular where I find that we need more such hymns is in the remembering of the final week of Jesus' life. We have Palm Sunday hymns and Good Friday hymns and Easter hymns, but we don't have many hymns that pay attention to the fuller narrative of Christ's Passion. So I would like to call your attention to two such hymns in this collection. The first of them, A Purple Robe, was written by Timothy Dudley Smith, whose numerous hymns are well known to Hymn Society members. Some of you may have encountered him at either the 1984 conference when he was made a fellow or at the 1997 conference when his hymns were celebrated in a plenary session. His text is set here to a tune composed for and named for it by 
David G. Wilson, one of the most prolific of the jubilati composers. A second hymn that is based on the events of the last week of Christ's life is When You Prayed Beneath the Trees by Christopher Idle, an Anglican clergyman who was one of the original members of the Jubilati Enterprise and who has continued to write many fine hymns. The tune used here is based on an anthem setting by the American composer Lloyd Larson. you 
shout, death and hell were put to rout, for the brave could not hold out, you are for me. Remembering that Moravian bishop's reminder that singing is an important means of expressing belief, I want to call attention to four hymns in this collection that help us appreciate various passages of Scripture more deeply by singing them. For example, if we need a hymn dealing with the Church, many of us are very likely to turn to that familiar staple the Church is One Foundation. That's a fine, familiar hymn about the Church, but it is all in a third-person, narrative and descriptive style. A much more direct and engaging alternative in this collection is Church of God, Elect and Glorious by James E. Seddon, a 20th century Anglican clergyman and missionary. Based on 1 Peter 2, 9-12, this hymn challenges the Church to live up to its calling as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. It is sung here to the familiar shape note tune, Nettleton. Another potential of hymns to help us appreciate and understand Scripture is to explore implications of the original text in ways that our customary English translations cannot do. For example, 
Almost all English translations of Colossians 1.15 have Paul describe Christ as the image of the invisible God. But the Greek word for image here is icon, a word that has come into English with the same sound but a different spelling. Describing Christ as the icon of God is a much less common phrase and it serves as an evocative and engaging opening for a chat like him with words and music by Janet Lunt, Icon of the Invisible God. The centrality of Christ's resurrection as the basis of Christian hope undergirds the Apostle Paul's admission in 1 Corinthians 15, 14. If Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. Working from this verse, Christopher Idle, whom we encountered earlier, has developed a very strong hymn beginning, If Christ Had Not Been Raised From Death. It is a confident affirmation of faith that would be especially fitting at a Christian funeral and can readily be sung to the familiar English folk tune, Kingsfold. Yeah. 
should face our final doom with neither guide nor friend. But now the Savior is raised up, so when a Christian dies, we mourn yet look to God in hope, in Christ the saints arise. If Christ had not been truly raised, his church would live a lie. His name should never more be praised. His words deserve to die. But now a great Our fourth example of a hymn that helps to open up scripture is once again by Christopher Idle, but this time he deals with a narrative rather than with a theological statement. The underlying story comes from John 2, 1 through 11, the account of Jesus's first miracle at the wedding feast in Cana. Rather than deal only with a single detail of water being changed into wine, Idle incorporates and applies multiple details connected with this event. The resulting hymn, Jesus, Come, For We Invite You, serves both as an expansive meditation on this particular passage and as a model of how Scripture can be read freshly and deeply. The hymn text is well supported by the sturdy tune, Sicilian Mariners. Come for we invite you, guest and master, friend and lord. Now, as once at Cana's wedding, speak and let us hear your word. Lead us through our need or doubting. Come transform our pleasures, guide us into paths unknown. Bring your gifts, come and your servants, let us trust in you. Live. 
One alternative to the hymn that explores specific scriptures deeply is the summary hymn that identifies essential truths and brings them together in a coherent pattern. A fine example from this jubilati collection can be found in Heal Me, Hands of Jesus by the late Anglican clergyman Michael Perry, who was actively involved in the work of the jubilati group from its very early days. It is an especially poignant text for those who are aware that almost 20 years after writing it, the author would himself spend the last year of his life suffering from a fatal brain tumor. Yet knowing that biographical detail is not necessary in order to feel the quiet power of this carefully patterned hymn in which every stanza moves towards peace. It is effectively set here to an adaptation of a tune from William Damon's Psalter. The healing power of God that was made known in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ continues to be present to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. So this next hymn could well be understood as an extension of the previous one. Spirit of God is a prayer hymn written by Martin Leckebusch, an elder in a Baptist church in England whose day job is in information technology. His numerous psalm paraphrases and hymns are well known in the UK and are gradually becoming recognized in North America for their blend of forthright and sensitive language. This text is effectively paired here with Joseph Barnby's well-known tune, O Perfect Love.
Returning to the Moravian bishop's dictum that we don't believe what we haven't sung, there are times when either the lengthiness of formal creedal statements or the lack of such statements in some traditions needs to be supplemented by concise and comprehensive hymns that state what we believe. One of the most effective such hymns is Michael Perry's I Believe in God the Father, which manages to say a great deal in the limited space of 120 syllables. It works well with Omni Die, a tune published in the 17th century by David Gregor Corner. Just as hymns can provide condensed and focused alternatives to formal creedal statements, prayer songs and refrains offer a meditative means of expanding and appropriating liturgical language. One well-known example of this sort comes from Argentina and adapts the objective liturgical sanctus into the subjective adoration of Santo, 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 in English, Holy, Holy, Holy. Obviously, this text is not a product of the Jubilati group. What they have contributed here is the arrangement of the music, which includes two different instrumental obligatos that you will hear during the last two sing-throughs. In an actual worship context, as opposed to a sample demonstration like this, the repeated singing of this prayer refrain would probably extend for quite a while longer.
Our final selection today illustrates another way in which this collection can be useful. If you find something here that you think might be too challenging for your congregation to sing successfully, that piece might well become an anthem for your choir. In fact, any choir that sings mainly unison music will find much useful material among the 63 items in this collection. The example we are about to hear is Born in Song, with text and music by Brian Hoare, a Methodist minister in the UK and a member of the Jubilati group. Some Canadians may recognize this hymn because it is included in Voices United. It is easy to imagine how this piece could be effectively sung by a choir as part of a hymn festival. Thank you for your attention during this presentation. I hope you have found something of interest among the 13 items we were able to explore today, but please keep in mind that this sample represents only about 20% of this collection's complete offerings. So you are very likely to find additional appealing pieces when you have an opportunity to examine the whole book which I hope you will soon have. Thank you again, and goodbye.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 